Hi everyone, Scott and Maddie here. Hi, Daddy. And welcome to <laughs> Queer as Pop Away Like That. Uh, the podcast where we discuss all things queer and how they intersect with pop culture, politics, and top headlines. How are you doing today, Maddie? I'm doing perfectly fine. I'm super excited because we actually have a few news coming along with the show and that we're gonna talk to you guys about. We are revamping our graphics and we're going to actually introduce something very special and very exciting for us. So we have actually gone through and started up a YouTube channel where you guys will be able to live chat with me and Scott every Sunday during the launch of the episodes. So it's going to be at 9 p.m. Central Eastern Time, 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time and 12 p.m. Noon Pacific Time. So we would very much enjoy if you guys would join us for this segment. I mean, I'm excited because it does give people a fun chance to tell us how silly and ridiculous we are live as they're listening to it and also ask us really cool questions about the show and and the guest and, you know, anything that we're talking about. So, I mean, it's going to be great. I mean, more interaction for me is always a positive. Yeah, I'm, I'm super excited about it. And uh, we're going to try to have uh, as many guests as possible as well to join the chat. So you guys will be able to interact with them as well. And, and just ask them in general questions about the episode or if there's anything that they talk about that you might find exciting, but you want them to elaborate on, they could do that on the chat for you guys. And any questions you want to forward uh, to me and Scott, just, just do it. We'll be right there with you guys. And I'm super excited for this. And it's going to be really great. So before we go over to the interview, I wanted to ask you, Scott, uh, I've heard a massive outcry from San Francisco and all the gays over there that you have been moving. (laughs) I don't know if people were crying or maybe cheering. Those two sounds can kind of get mixed up a little bit. But um, yeah, I'm actually relocating to Seattle. So I will be um, living my best Meg Ryan fantasy looking (laughs) for my Tom Hanks. Yeah, because this is where you're from, technically, or Washington is the state you're from. Yeah, 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 yeah. So my family grew up in Washington State, and so I'll be much closer to them, which uh, I'm very excited about. It's always nice to be closer to family. Would you like to tell me a little bit about what kind of things that you would want me to see once I visit? Is there any exciting things that you want want us to do? I mean, I think that there's some of the obligatory, um, uh, like touristy things, like going down to Fisherman's Wharf that you just have to do. I mean, you'll mm-hmm. roll your eyes up through most of it, but you just got to do it. Um, I think taking you to like a Seahawks game um, is incredible because, uh, especially once we have COVID no longer looming over us, being in a stadium full of like just frenzied seattle fans it's pretty (laughs) special uh so yeah just like a whole bunch of varied stuff like that and we also got to check out nature because you know the pacific northwest has one of the few temperate rainforests in existence and i've been able to be there a few times and it is gorgeous so yeah just lots of nature to do as well i would love to experience that oh i can't wait it'll be such a good time absolutely so Guys, today's guest is someone that we are super excited to have on, and uh, I can't wait for you guys to hear her. Uh, So we're going to move over over to the interview straight away. Welcome back, everyone. Today's guest is someone who I deeply admire and, in my mind, one of the most prominent voices for the trans community. She's a former Marine, record-breaking powerlifter and bodybuilder who utilizes her social platforms to educate and spread awareness about topics such as transphobia, being non-binary both in spaces within and outside of competitive sports. Janae Mary Kroc, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. So we're past the election. How are you doing? I'm uh, doing very well and hopeful with the election results, although there's still a lot of turmoil going on. I I think in the end, uh, things will move in a positive direction for our community. So so definitely feeling hopeful right now. Yeah. 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 I mean, you know, it's got to be, you know, such a relief to see, you know, that we'll have Biden in the office and, you know, really helping bring back some, I think, the norms that we had grown accustomed to. So it's, it's so exciting to have that. 
Yeah, exactly. And, and I, I think, and hopefully um, having someone that will do more to unify the country instead of divide us, because I think that's one of the biggest issues we had with, you know, the previous president was just how divisive everything became and how much polarization it caused in the country, and which I think is just negative for everyone. Yeah, yeah. It's just that, that unity aspect is going to be so important, I think, in people's mindsets. But um, before we really kick off our interview, we always like to ask a little icebreaker for our guests. So uh, I think the question that we would both love to ask you is, who are the three people, Janae, in your life that you admire the most? Oh, wow. Um, yeah, that's a tough one. There's so many people. I, I'm not the type of person to really idolize anyone or... Um, you know, try to emulate what someone else has done, but there's certainly a lot of people I respect. Um, as far as like, <clears throat> excuse me, um, like public public figures or you know famous type people, um, Marsha P. Johnson and Carolyn Cassie are two trans women that I greatly admire. Um, for those of you that aren't familiar with them, Carolyn Cassie um, was one of the first trans women to come out publicly. Uh, she was actually a very well-known model prior to being outed after appearing in a James Bond, a James Bond movie in the 1980s. Um, she was the first exposure I ever had to trans women. And um, I remember seeing her on a daytime talk show when I was just a young child. I was homesick from school one day and um, I was literally, you know, transfixed to the screen and, and just amazed by her story. And I was really impressed with how well she handled herself in, in such a crazy situation. There were a lot of very rude and insulting questions, and she was very composed and um, very uh, articulate in her responses. And I was just really impressed. And, and of course, that being a professional model, she was drop dead gorgeous. And up to that point, I just never knew something like that was possible. And um, but I think what impressed me most about her was that, you know, she was a trailblazer. She was one of the first women coming out and doing this. And she made herself open and available and agreed to do all these talk shows and interviews. And even though, like, especially back then in the 1980s, there was, like I said, there were a lot of very insulting and and she wasn't treated all that well, but handled, handled herself amazingly. And so that was someone from a young age that I really looked up to and admired and, you know, for setting that mold and being willing to step out there when very few people were. And then um, for people that aren't fam familiar with Marsha P. Johnson, she was a trans woman of color who was instrumental in the Stonewall riots, um, you know, back in 1969 and really helped the whole, um, you know, LGBT movement um, really break through and move forward and become more of a mainstream thing. People don't realize that back at that time, um, being gay or trans was actually illegal and you could be arrested for that. You could be arrested for what they considered gay behavior. So if you were holding hands or showing affection in public with someone of the same sex, you could actually be thrown in jail for that. And, and LGBT people were frequently harassed and, and jailed. And um, the same thing, back then they often used the, the term more transvestite, which we don't really use anymore. And most people consider to be derogatory. But um but they would actually arrest people for what they considered non-gender appropriate behavior, which essentially means, you know, like trans women dressing like women. And um, they, they would do police could grab people and do inspections, which basically pull off their clothes or, you know, make them show more of their bodies to, to see if they were, in fact, trans. And um, but these both these women were very instrumental in, you know, really being strong voices for our community and moving everything forward. Um, so there are two women that I have a ton of respect for and uh, really admire what they did. And then um, and outside that community and more from the weightlifting world, there's a lot of people um, that I had a lot of respect for and looked up to as, um, you know, as I was building my career and moving forward as an athlete. Uh, but Dave Tate particularly stands out to me. Um, Dave's the owner of Elite FTS and was one of my sponsors and was always very supportive. Um, after I came on board with them in 2006, a year later, I came out to him long before I was outed publicly and told him everything. And he was very supportive and has been until this day. Um, so I, you know, greatly appreciated that and his support, especially in a world where, you know, it was, it's a very, what people consider very hardcore blue collar and not the most accepting of our community. And Dave was the type of guy too, that, um, when we had any kind of business arrangement or whatever as, as being a sponsored athlete for elite. And then like I sold my DVDs and other things through his website and everything was always just a handshake. 
we didn't sign contracts. And that's so rare in today's world that you can just trust someone like that. So I've always had a lot of respect for his integrity and just, you know, his strength of character as a person. Speaking of the conditions and terms that trans people have to live under, I wanted to talk to you about a recent uh, controversy. And not too long ago, a pretty popular trans woman, a YouTuber named Blair White, who is known for her very conservative views and specifically for deliberately targeting transgender individuals and spreading misinformation, got into a controversy which involved you. And the reason I state that it was deliberate is because it's been proven that she more or less constructs her own stories to fit with a specific agenda uh, that applies to her viewers. Could you explain to me exactly what, what she did and how this affected you on a personal level? Yeah, so I think it's been about a month and a half now or so since this happened. But what happened was um, Blair made a video about trans athletes. And I was, you know, she talked about a couple people, but I was the primary focus of her video. And she used my image in the thumbnail. And um, which was really disconcerting was she used a quote underneath my image that would give the impression to anyone that it was something that I had said. But I, think, I believe the quote was, um, I deserve... I'm, let's see, what was it? I am trans. I deserve to compete in women's sports. Get over it. And of course, this is nothing I've ever said um, or would say. And, um, and even though she didn't put my name after it, it was underneath my picture and definitely gave the impression that it was coming from me. Um, so I felt that was particularly misleading, but, but she got a lot of stuff wrong in the video. Um, she actually said that I compete in women's sports, which I never have. And, and that's particularly disturbing to me because I've been very vocal about the fact that I, um, all my championships, all my world records, everything I've done was in the men's division prior to transition, and that I have no intention of competing as a woman and never have. And I've, I've been very vocal about that. And, and for a number of reasons, and we can talk about those reasons um, in a minute if you want to, but... Um, but so I've been very clear about my intentions and she actually stated that I do compete with women and get, and definitely gave the impression that I was, you know, winning championships there and breaking records. And, um, and then in the, even, and she went to my Instagram and pulled some of the photos and some of my posts. And, and the funny thing is, is one of the posts she pulled actually right in the caption that she used, it, it stated in there, I talked about how I have never competed as a woman, have no intention to do so. So, you know, while I can't say what was going on in Blair's mind and no, none of us know exactly what she was thinking, um, you know, it definitely appears that um, at the very least she should have known better. Um, she, the, you know, she left the video up. I mean, I see the day after the video, I was made aware of it. Um, I, I noticed right away I started receiving all these hateful messages and, um, you know, just on my different social media channels and private messages and, you know, people basically attacking me for competing in women's sports. And so right away I knew something was up. I was thinking, OK, there must be an article or video or something posted somewhere. And then I had some of my fans contact me and they're like, hey, did you see, you know, Blair White's video about you? And I was like, no, I wasn't even really familiar with Blair yet. So I looked it up and I think this was the day after it, it, it had gone live. And um, I immediately put a comment in the video, um, under the video on YouTube, saying, hey, Blair, you know, this is incorrect. I wish you had reached out to me before you made it and, you know, are spreading misinformation. If you have any questions, please contact me. Well, that comment right away got, I mean, I know after a little while, it had thousands of likes and hundreds of other comments under it. And lot, lots of people recognized me and knew where I stood on these things. And we're all correcting her saying, hey, look, this, you, you know, you're wrong about Janae. You need to take the video down. You need to issue an apology, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I reached out to her through all our social media channels. I even had my lawyer send her a private email. And, um, but we got no response and the video stayed up. So the video stayed up for several weeks before she finally took it down. Initially, she issued an apology on Twitter, which everyone kind of thought was odd because the video was on YouTube. And anyone who has, you know, works in social media realizes that you have very different groups of people that follow different forms of social media. Um, so if you post something on YouTube and then you post something on Twitter, a lot of that same crowd isn't even going to be aware of it. And then after more pressure, so a whole bunch of videos started coming out from other people um, like Sam Collins um, and a number of other prominent YouTubers, um, you know, basically calling Blair out, you know, explaining what she got wrong. 
And we all noticed that her followers um, started to plummet. She had just broke the million subscriber mark. And um, I think last time I checked, she's lost over 20,000 followers, I believe it is. And so she was losing at first. She was losing like 1,000 followers a day when people realized what was going on. And um, but then so she got called out a number of times and then ended up finally making a YouTube video. And this had to be like over a month. She did take the YouTube video down, did the Twitter apology and then actually DM'd me and apologized or re replied to the DM I had sent her. So I did appreciate the apology. I did appreciate the fact that she took the video down. And then um, she finally made a YouTube video apologizing. But it was also, you know, like I said, I don't know what's in Blair ha Blair's head and what her intentions are. But it, it did come across as being somewhat defensive and and say, you know, acknowledging she made a mistake and taking responsibility for it, but basically stating it was due to a lack of research and she's just too busy. And, um, you know, it was due to her not having the time to do a proper job of researching the information. Whether or not that's true, only Blair knows. Um, but yeah, the, the hard part for me about all this is once something like that is put out um, and people see it, there's really no taking it back. Um, even though, you know, taking the video down, issuing an apology, there's still going to be, you know, she has, at the time, she had a million subscribers. I know the video was seen by over half a million people. A lot of those people, you know, after they see the video once, are going to believe whatever they saw in the video. Many of them are never going to notice that the video was taken down. They're not going to see, um, you know, an apology posted a month and a half later or whatever it was. And I'm um, certainly probably not going to see a small blurb posted on Twitter. So it's hard to tell what kind of damage that does and how, you know, how far those effects reach. Um, for me, for someone who now, like I, I'm a pharmacist by trade, but I left that a year ago to focus on activism and education. And so now I make my living by public speaking and, you know, writing and educating. And it's, it's hard to say when something like this happens you know, how many hundreds of thousands of people have seen this and now believe those things about me, even though they're not true. And you never know if there's a speaking opportunity that comes up or maybe I'm being considered for a certain event. But then someone who only knows my name through these videos and misinformation like this is going to be like, oh, no, we don't want that person on here. Um, you know, so it's hard to say what kind of effects that's going to have, you know, currently and down the road. Um, you know, I'm really thankful that so many of my fans came to my support and a lot of people helped correct the misinformation, but it, but it's really difficult to ascertain, you know, what kind of effect that's going to have in the long term. Yeah, yeah, I can totally understand that that must have been a very frustrating moment for you. Uh, just for the sake of educating our viewers a little bit and make them uh, understand exactly how these things manifest. And would you would you be comfortable with elaborating on what kind of online harassment of abuse uh, you got and uh, what do you think the, are the psychological aspects maybe to Blair's uh, behavior and why she would do something like this to someone like you who is part of the community? Yeah, you know, like I said, it, it's it's hard to understand what's going on in Blair Blair's mind or her motivation. I mean, unfortunately, she does have a history of doing this. Um, she seems to target people from the trans community that don't pass. Um, for those of you that aren't familiar with Blair, um, she's a very attractive, very feminine looking trans woman, you know, who, if she wanted to be stealth, um, could easily do so. Um, she's very passable, very feminine, and she seems to take offense to people. Um, she's posted a number of videos in the past talking about how people that don't pass as trans women that still look quite masculine, but identify as trans, how she feels they're taking away from the trans community, they're delegitimizing her identity and things of that, that nature. Um, so she has a history of targeting trans people that don't fit you know, in that neat binary of, of you know, female and male that we're socialized um, to accept. And, um, and she's done, you know, there's been much worse videos than what happened to me. There was, she wrongly identified um, one person as a, as a child predator and she had the incorrect um, person's picture. And this person I know received a lot of hate and, um, you know, threatening threats of violence and things like that. And she had the wrong person altogether. Um, so unfortunately she does have a history of doing these things and especially targeting people that don't fit her idea of what a trans person is supposed to be. And, um, you know, for me, fortunately, yes, while this, you know, was very frustrating. I mean, I think it's frustrating for anyone, anytime, 
misinformation and lies are spread about someone, especially when it's something you've been very clear about. Um, and like I said, it could have an impact for me as far as like, you know, um, financial concerns in the future, missed opportunities, things like that. Psychologically, fortunately, you know, I'm a mature person who's used to being in the spotlight for a while from my previous powerlifting career, you know, having been on magazines and having been someone, um, you know, that's been talked about a lot online. So I, I was used to receiving hate and I'm, and I'm used to being the topic of controversy, especially after I was outed in 2015. So I, I've got a pretty thick skin when it comes to all of that. So for me, it was more frustration than anything. But for a lot of people, this could be emotionally devastating, um, you know, and cause some really, you know, um, a lot of emotional turmoil and, and some really long lasting effects. And it, it's just so hard. You know, everyone deals with things differently. But having something like this and facing online harassment and bullying and things like that can be really difficult for most people. Um, like I said, fortunately, it's something I'm used to and I've learned how to handle. And, um, you know, being who I am and being someone that's somewhat of a controversial figure in the trans community because of my appearance and my muscularity, um, you know, I, I'm kind of used to having to deal with these things. But, but it's still difficult. And I, more than anything, I just really hope that Blair, um, you know, grows from this and takes things in a more positive direction in the future. Um, you know, it's just really unfortunate that this happened and more unfortunate that it's happened numerous times over the last couple of years. And she just has a history of basically kind of throwing the transgender community under the bus to gain the support of her conservative followers. Um, you know, like I said, only Blair know what's, knows what's going on in her mind, but, um, but I, I hope we see change from her in the future that's better for our community and better for everyone. Thank you so much for sharing that because it's, I think it's very important for uh, our listeners, listeners to know about the consequences of this type of behavior and when, what happens when you attack someone within the trans community. So uh, talking about your life in general, how did your coming out story unfold and what were the greatest challenges for you? Oh, gosh. Well, it was super difficult initially. Like um, most people, you know, I, I basically fought my identity for a really long time. Um, I knew by the time or five or six that I was trans Although I couldn't put those words to it, I didn't know what it meant, but I knew I had serious issues with my gender. But I grew up in a small town in a rural environment, and I knew that it was not okay to tell people how I felt, that it was not going to be received well. I, I had already learned by that age what was appropriate for little boys, what was appropriate for little girls, and understood that if I crossed those lines, there were going to be very serious consequences. Um, so I basically buried everything down and hid it all. And I never told anyone how I felt until I was 23. And then I still buried it until I was probably in my early 30s is when I really started dealing with it. And basically, I just got to a point I didn't do it any longer. Um, I was like basically breaking down emotionally. And um, I told the uh, I was married at the time and she had known and she's the first person I told my ex-wife. And she knew everything before we even started dating. Uh, we were friends initially, then started dating and later got married. And she was supportive initially, but it didn't last very long. And then I just went back to suppressing everything. And then towards the end of our marriage, I, you know, I told her, I can't do this anymore. I've got to deal with this. And, and um, we ended up splitting up. And, and that was only one of many factors. I mean, we had a lot of issues that, you know, people married uh, 10 years with young kids have. But um but basically at that point, I started coming out to family and friends. And initially, it was super difficult. My first close friend that I told, it literally took me three months of conversations to come out to him. And I was so terrified of losing all my friends, losing my family. Um, I didn't think anyone would accept me. And at this point, I was nearing the peak of my powerlifting career. So on, you know, on one hand, I'm on the cover of magazines. Um, you know, I've, I've got tons of fans all over the world and things are going really well. But the more success I experienced, the, the more difficult it felt to come out. Like I felt like everyone had put me up on this pedestal. You know, I was this kid from this small town that had a number of areas. And, um, you know, I, I heard there were posters of me up in my old high school. And, um, you know, but the, the more the more that grew, the more difficult it became. And I felt like I was going to be disappointing everyone, that I was going to destroy this image of what everyone had of me and just let all these people down. And um, so it was just I felt this immense pressure not to come out. And um, but I just got to a point where I couldn't do it anymore. I actually was um, considering suicide and, you know, it got to a really dark place. 
because I just didn't see any way my life was ever going to work out. And um, I didn't think anyone would ever love me, that I could really be in a healthy relationship. And um, it was really difficult for, for quite a while. And um, but I slowly started coming out to friends. And um, fortunately, everyone was supportive. And um, I have an amazing group of friends that I still have to this day. And uh, they were all supportive. Um, a lot of my family was, but the family had mixed reactions. My mom and dad didn't take the news very well. Um, for anyone who's seen the documentary, um, it's titled Transformer and it's available on Netflix. And um, it, uh, it basically follows me for the two years. I was outed publicly in 2015 and the documentary follows me for the two years after that. Um, but my three sons, I had told them when they were very young, when they were two, four and six. So they knew their whole lives. So for them growing up, um, they, you know, it was just part of who I am. And it, and I think it really helped establish a really close bond between us. And there's a lot of trust there and love and, um, they, they've always been super supportive. So that's been amazing for me. And, uh, like I said, almost all my friends were very supportive. Um, the family, like I said, mis mixed reactions, um, some of the like extended family, like my aunts and uncles that I had been really close to, um, backed off and basically don't talk to me anymore. But then there were some people that I wasn't as close to that reached out and have been more supportive since. Um, and then, like I just mentioned in 2015 at this point, so I was out to my all my family. I was out to my friends. And I, the only reason I wasn't out in a hundred percent and to the public was because I was concerned about how this might affect my sons. Um, you know, they were still in school and I had discussions with a number of people close to me about what would be the best way to handle this. And cause I really wanted to be out. I wanted to get into activism. I wanted to start speaking and talk about all this stuff, but I didn't want my sons to have to face a bunch of adversity. We didn't know how their peers would react. We didn't know how their teachers or coaches might react. And I just didn't want them to have to deal with all of that. You know, being young kids in school is hard enough. And, um, but in 2015, I got outed by a YouTuber um, and uh, it went viral. And it was just, I'll never forget it. It was 11 o'clock on a Monday morning and I'm at work and my phone just starts blowing up. And initially it's my friends telling me, you know, I just got outed and it's all over the internet. And then within 30 minutes, I've got Inside Edition, um, TMZ, like all these, you know, media news places blowing me up, wanting interviews. And I just thought to myself, well, you know what, if my story is going to be told, I want to be the one to tell it. And um, so I accepted all the interviews. And for like the next month, I basically did nonstop interviews. And um, and then I was able to come out about everything. And it ended up being, you know, a silver lining to what appeared to be dark clouds initially. I mean, it did cause me, it did cause some significant hurdles. Um, I lost my sponsorships with my biggest, my biggest sponsors. Um, so there was a lot of income I lost there and exposure. And, um, and some of them weren't even, they didn't hide the fact that they were dropping me because I was trans. So they thought it would be negative PR and didn't want it to hurt their brand. So they dropped me right away. Uh, Muscle Tech was one of the main ones that did that. And then um, it caused some turmoil at, in my career. And um, it, it was it was rough for a little while, for sure. But um, But after I got through all of that, it ended up being a positive thing. And it opened up opportunities for me to speak about being trans and non-binary. And, um, you know, now I, you know, I couldn't be happier. I'm really happy with how things have gone, but it, it definitely, um, you know, caused some turmoil for a while. and was, a, was a difficult period to get through. Wow. Yeah. That's, I, I can only imagine the emotional roller coaster you must've been going through, through so much of that. Um, wow. Um, so I have a, a small change of direction then, but still, I think very pertinent to what we've been discussing. So one of the major arguments transphobes and particularly TERFs, and if you're not, if our audience is not familiar with that term, it's trans exclusionary radical feminists. Um, they've used a primary arg argument against trans individuals is there's this perceived discrepancy between performance levels of women and trans women. Um, maybe, uh, Jenny, could you tell us a little bit more? about some of the misconceptions that are out there, um, what the actual studies have proven, and also, and I think more importantly, what needs to be done further to make a space for trans individuals in competitive sports. Okay, whole that's a whole bunch to unpack there, but, but I'm glad you brought it up. I think those are really important topics to talk about. 
Um, yeah, it, it's really unfortunate with the turfs um, that I, I really don't understand where they're coming from. But but basically, for people who aren't familiar with them, it's a group of, um, like you said, trans-exclusionary radical feminists. Um, some of them tend to be part of the lesbian community, but not all of them. And um, they just, for whatever reason, really do not like trans women and feel that we're invading women-only spaces and somehow... Um, like we're imposters or spies or delegitimizing their experiences as women. And they can be, and I've, I've actually had a couple of them attack me publicly, like on Twitter and stuff like that. But it was, it was never anything that blew up too big and um, just a series of messages and stuff like that. But they basically, you know, state that, that we're men, we're, we'll always be men and that, and sometimes they like to take the narrative that it's like a, a dress up thing or a fetish, you know, like a fetish or something like that. And just kind of really twist the whole thing. I, I really don't understand where their anger and hate is coming from. Um, I consider myself a feminist, of course, and um, but a, um, a intersectional feminist, which, you know, believes for people that aren't familiar with that term, basically believes that um, feminism, feminism is for all women and that's all races, all um, ethnicities, all, um, all women from different backgrounds, trans women, cis women, you know, and that feminine is something, feminine, feminism is something that should be embraced by all of us and shared, and it strengthens all of us as a whole. Um, obviously, TERFs do not share that view, and, um, but yeah, it, it's unfortunate, and, um, but I think no matter what, when there's things like this, you're going to have hate, and that's just one of the groups that a lot of it comes from, but yeah, there's just a lot of misconceptions with trans women. It's the idea, there's been some researchers in the past, um, like Ray Blanchard and some other people that propose this theory of autogynephilia. And for those of you that have never heard about that, it's basically a theory that states that trans women fall into two groups is what this researcher um, claimed. And either trans women that were actually gay men and were transitioning to be with men and if, and if that wasn't the case, then they were, um, it was a fetish. And these trans women were doing this because they sexualized themselves as women and it was somehow erotic for them. And so it twisted it into this like perversion. And, um, and there's still a lot of people in the conservative world that this, this theory gets passed around. And because there's some researchers that put it out there, people tend to think it was somehow legitimate research. And, um, Every once in a while, I'll even see a comment on um, some of my YouTube videos and stuff like that. Oh, oh, here's a perfect example of autogynophilia. And um, so it, it's, it's long been debunked. Um, but and let me explain that a little bit to people. So this idea that, you know, dressing up as a woman and stuff is purely like an autoerotic uh, fetish has it, it, been debunked um, a number of times. But uh, the, one of the studies that clearly showed how flawed this was was that they gave the same series of questions um, to cis women that they had given to trans women. And the overwhelming majority of cis women also scored considered to have autogynephilia. Um, so I, I don't know, I feel looking at it like the a lot of the questions were designed to give the result the researcher was looking for. And there were some other blatant, um, obvious like giveaways of what their intentions were because they stated openly that they felt like so basically any of the trans women who didn't answer the questions the way they wanted them to, they claimed the trans women were lying. They said that they're, oh, there was a big problem with the trans women being truthful and um, lying during the questionnaires. So basically anything that didn't fit into their narrative that they already have, um, they, they said the trans women weren't being honest. Um, so there's a, a lot of flaws, but you, if people come across that, this auto, autogynephilia, just know that it's been debunked. It's, it's honestly garbage research. It was very biased. And another dead giveaway was the fact that it didn't apply to trans men. It only applied to trans women. So if this was really had some basis in being trans, it would apply to both trans men and women, not just one. But there's a number of reasons why it's garbage research. And, um, but for people who stumble across that or hear about it, um, just know that, like I said, it's been debunked and, and it's just, it was something that somebody did that clearly had an agenda. Um, but, uh, <clears throat> but yeah. And then as far as like trans athletes go, there's, this is another whole huge topic that I'm currently in the process of writing articles and making videos about, cause there's so much that needs to be talked about here. Um, 
But with trans athletes, so I'll be the first to admit we need more studies in, you know, larger groups and, um, and across a wider array of athletes, especially strength athletes. But that being said, the studies we do have um, have shown repeatedly that after at least one year on um, hormone replacement therapy, which means estrogen supplementation and testo either testosterone suppression through medication or surgery, excuse me, um, that the performance of these athletes decreases um, approximately like so one of the major studies that is used right now and is widely quoted was done mainly on middle distance runners and in middle distance running the average difference between male and female athletes is about 11 to 12 percent um, so the women perform at about 11 um, 11 to 12 percent uh, slower times than the males what they found was after these athletes transitioned from male to female their performance decreased on average about 11 to 12 percent so if they were in the 80, 80th percentile as a male runner, after a year or more on hormones and testosterone suppression, their performance dropped to where they were in the 80th percentile for the female runners. Um, so people were expecting like, oh my gosh, I'm going to transition and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to excel as a female runner. And that just did not happen. Um, and then some other things that are easy to point out is um, like with the Olympics, there's the, um, in 2003, there was a, a meeting um, known as the Stockholm Consensus, and this allowed transgender athletes to start competing in the Olympics, which started in 2004 with Athens. And, and trans women have been allowed, and trans men have been allowed to compete in the Olympics every year since. Well, in all those Olympics since 2004, not only has there never been an Olympic gold medal or Olympic record set by a trans woman, there have been no Olympic medals of any kind. And actually, no, no trans woman has even been able to qualify for an Olympic team um, that we know of. I mean, there's been some rumors of possibly um, a couple athletes that were competing in stealth, but the rumor was that they weren't able to medal or do anything either. And we don't even know if that's 100% true. But, um, but yeah, so trans women, and we're getting, you know, 16 plus years have not been able to have any success in the Olympics whatsoever. And then you'll see, if you get online, you'll see all these articles. If you, if you, if you just Google trans athletes um, in women's sports, you will get a number of articles that show up saying trans women are destroying women's sports, how they're smashing all these world records and how they're having all this success. Well, the reality of it, it's all not true. They're spinning all these stories and changing the narrative to fit, you know, their agenda, but what, what, and how they're doing this is so like Laurel Hubbard is one that's um, talked about most often. She's a trans woman, uh, Olympic weightlifter. Now Laurel has done quite well. She's won the, uh, the uh, Australian championship. She won the uh, Pacific games and she won the, the Masters Women's World Championships. And for those that aren't familiar with sports, Masters divisions are like the older divisions. Um, I think in Laurel's case, it was, uh, um, well, I don't even want to say because I'm not 100% sure, but, but it would not be your open division. It's not your main divisions you see competing. They're older age groups, you know, usually like athletes in their 40s and things like that. So Laurel won the Masters Women World Championships. Well, that in the media, that was made, made, it was made to seem that she won an Open Worlds against the best women, which she did not do. At the Open Worlds um, in 2019, she managed to play sixth. So against the other best women in the world, she was sixth best. So, and she's a long ways from, would have been from meddling at the 2019 World Championships. Um, she was, I know she was at least like, I think it was 57 or 60 pounds out of third and over a hundred pounds out of first place, which for Olympic weightlifting is a wide margin. And, um, so for Laura, so the idea that like, you know, like I said, if you pull her up and look at any articles, it's going to make it sound like she's smashing all the women she's beating everyone. And while she has had some success, certainly, um, but the Australian games and the Pacific games, these are not like top tier weightlifting championships in women's weightlifting. Like I said, when she faced the best athletes, she was sixth best in the world and that, and she had her best meet ever by far. She put her best total together she ever had and was still only sixth. She was actually not even expected to place in the top 10 at that meet. Um, but uh, that's just one example. And I could go into a number of others. Uh, Fallon Fox is a female, a trans woman, um, female MMA fighter. And she is, Joe Rogan's talked about her extensively. 
And, um, you know, there's been all this more than any trans athlete. She's probably received more hates and threats of violence than anyone. I feel really bad for her. But because the nature of her sport, the fact that she's a fighter and, um, you know, this was misconstrued as a man fighting women. And and it made it sound everyone who talked about her made it sound like she was smashing all her competition and just destroying these other women. Well, the thing is, so she was a pro. So on the surface, it looks like, oh, my God, yeah, she was doing really, really well. But when we look closer of her five victories, not a single one of these women had a winning record. Two of them had never won a single fight. So she was fighting very low level competition. The one fighter she fought that had a winning record, um, Ashley Evan Smith, who fights in the UFC, she's her 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 winning her overall record is barely above 500. She actually has a losing record inside the UFC. I think the last time I checked, she was like four and six in the UFC, and she TKO'd uh, Fallon. And um, so she's like a mid level pro fighter in the UFC, and and you know, and she beat Fallon easily. And, uh, but it would make, you know, they make it sound like she was destroying all these women that you, you also see, if you look her up, you're going to see articles about how Fallon Fox crushes this woman's skull and fractured a woman's skull. And that sounds horrific on the surface. If you look into it deeper, again, there's a lot of misleading information. What it was, was an orbital fracture. The orbital bone is a bone that goes around the eye socket. It's a very common injury in MMA. Almost all the top athletes have suffered orbital fractures. It's like I said, it's very common. Other women have caused orbital fractures in other women in MMA fights. So this is not something that's unusual at all. But yet, when you pull up Fallon Fox, you're gonna they make it sound like she split someone's skull open. Um, so it's like all these ideas and all this stuff is just really um, a lot of misinformation and exaggerated. And not to say that trans women haven't had any success. We we have had some trans women. Um, CC Telfer's one that won a Division II national championship in um, in sprinting, but um, but this idea that trans women are out there smashing all these world records and dominating women's sports simply isn't true at all. There have not only have there has never uh, trans woman never medaled in the Olympics. No trans woman in any sport in the entire world has ever won an open world championship. So basically, what I'm saying is, no trans woman has beat the best women in any sport in any way. And so all these articles out there and all this information is very misleading. And for the lay person to try to look this stuff up on the internet, you're definitely going to get the impression that it happens all the time and that trans women are just dominating women's sports. But the reality is it has not happened and isn't happening. And like I said, I'll be the first to admit we need more studies and, and greater numbers and things like that. And we're going to get that as more trans women are open and are competing and, um, you know, there's less fear about um, hate and violence and things like that, even though that's still very common. Um, we're we're going to have those numbers in the future. But as of right now, the, the success of trans women has been greatly overstated and it's very misleading. And unfortunately, it's caused a lot of hate and a lot of um, animosity towards the trans community as a whole. Wow. Yeah, that's I. Yeah. So just then to clarify like so it sounds to me like you're you're very aware of that there is a, a host of misinformation out there or an imperfect picture and so for you you would just like to have more information that's more thoughtfully constructive around a a, a true narrative of what a trans athlete is going through and experiencing versus maybe some of these slanted arguments that you typically would see on the internet right now Exactly. I mean, I'm all for the truth, regardless of what that is. And I mean, if future studies come out and show that trans women clearly have an advantage and that they are having a disproportionate amount of success, then I believe that's something that should be dealt with. And the rules may need, need to be adjusted to, um, you know, account for that. Um, I'm also part of uh, an organization that is establishing powerlifting and bodybuilding specifically for trans and non-binary athletes. And, um, and it's more it's it's more to provide a safe place for these athletes to compete, both like physical safety and, you know, emotional safety, just some place that's welcoming and safe and people feel comfortable um, being out. But but, yeah, I'm a, just a big believer in fairness and truth. And, um, I, you know, I, like I said, we need more research, but but I just want to see the truth put out there. Like, let's talk. Let's talk about this. Let's have an open dialogue. Let's, you know, look at all the data. Let's look at all the athletes and let's, let's, you know, create sport 
that's fair for everyone based on the real data and not on biased opinions or someone who has an agenda and someone is trying to drive hate and stuff towards a trans community. Um, Cause this is unfortunately for trans women, especially this is where a lot of, a lot of animosity is stirred up and, and, and the, you know, the trans community unfortunately definitely feels the brunt of that. Yeah. Yeah. So shifting gears just a, a little bit, I mean, it's near the end of 2020, the election for people in the U S has obviously been top of mind and talked about at ad, ad nauseum. So it looks like we successfully will be having Trump out of the office here in the next few months with a obvious then shift in the political landscape with the new Biden administration. Um, so for our listeners, what are some of the changes in policies that you would love to see that are going to help um, the future for trans and non-binary individuals? Yeah, well, one of the first things I expect to happen, which I think is very important, is removing the ban on transgender uh, military. Um, before, you know, prior to Trump getting into office, transgender people were finally allowed to serve openly in the military. And that was one of the first things his administration did was to take that away. Um, they did allow people that were already out and already serving to stay, but you're not allowed to join the military if you're openly trans. And if you were in the military and you were trans, but not out about it yet, you were not allowed to come out or you would be discharged. Um, so that's very important, I think. And I, I expect that'll be one of the first things the Biden administration does is to reverse that and allow transgender um, you know, U.S. citizens to serve openly in the military again, which I think is very important. And the thing is, a huge portion of the trans community, myself included, have served in the military. And um, so, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, the whole thing was just that that was a really hard pill to swallow, especially coming from a leader who dodged, you know, service and never served himself. And I just feel like, how dare you say that, you know, we cannot serve or we're not fit to serve. Um but I, I, so I think that's very important. And also um, just, you know, one of the first thing, a lot of people don't realize so much of this, so much of this flew under the radar, unless you're part of the trans community. But one of the things the Trump administration did as soon as they came into office was to remove all language from the, um, from the official White House documents pertaining to, um, you know, anything about gender and any, anything other than male and female. They basically removed all of that. They removed it from polls. They removed it from different documents, basically trying to create a place where the transgender community was not represented. Like we didn't show up in statistics. We wouldn't show up when they did polls about things. And um, so, it, yeah, it basically erases our community from being represented. And um, and this and some of this stuff, a lot of like all everything on the White House website about that mentioned anything about trans people or gender variant people was taken down, I believe, the first day they were in office. This, so this was something that they had planned and had a very strong intent to do from day one. Um, so and then obviously there's, you know, I'm hoping for um, more inclusive health care for trans individuals and stuff that's vital for trans people. And um, I know there's some controversy surrounding that, and and but there's also been a lot of misinformation there, and people thinking that a lot of these procedures are cosmetic, or you know, just you know people are doing it for fun or because they can, and that and that's totally not the case. These are literally life-saving procedures for trans people, and there's numerous studies out there to show that gender-affirming, um, you know, hormones and surgeries are, save lives, decrease. Um, decreased depression, decreased suicide. And, you know, so it's very, very clear the outcomes. And so I'm hoping we'll see more inclusive trans health care. Um, but there, yeah, there's just so many ways. And, and one thing that is one thing I'm very, very hopeful with this um, administration is that things like this are going to happen. We're going to move forward. That language is going to be included. I mean, in, in his acceptance speech, Biden even made it a point to mention transgender people. So that alone sends a clear message of, you know, where you know what they have in mind and the fact that they they are aware of our community and they are supportive thank you for sharing that uh with us so that people actually have a big grasp on what's what's actually happened within the trans community during these last four years and the damages that, that have been done by this administration i think it's very important to highlight that uh so before we uh before we wrap everything up i want to throw you over to our lightning round of fun questions. Uh, so these are very brief questions that you can answer in whatever way you like. And uh, so I'm just going to ask you, are you ready? Yes. 
All right. So the first question I have is, what is one thing that annoys you the most? Um, I, I would say it's the most annoying thing, especially being trans, is just all the misinformation out there, like all the things we've talked about today. But this idea that we're, you know, that being trans is either a lifestyle choice or that it's somehow a fetish or things like that. It's just it's very frustrating to have people question your core identity and to assert it to be either your quote unquote crazy mentally slash mentally ill slash perverted, you know, that whole narrative. So I, I think I think that the most frustrating thing. Um, about being trans. That's very understandable. Uh, favorite junk food? Oh my gosh, have to be, <laughs> oh, can I, can I name two? How about uh, pizza and ice cream? Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so the next one I have for you is, what was the last film you watched? Oh boy. Um, I'm a big fan of independent films and documentaries and um I think Disclosure may have been the last one I watched. And for those of you that aren't familiar, Disclosure does a very good job of um, illustrating how Hollywood um, in particular has affected the trans community. And um, it, I think it's a very important film. Uh, anyone that's interested in any of this should really look up. It's available on Netflix. It's called Disclosure. Um, and it does a very good job of, like I said, of showing how um, these negative images in media have really affected trans people. I mean, just off the top of my head, um, just think about, like, if you think about trans people in movies and stuff, what immediately comes to mind? Buffalo Bill from Silence of the Lambs. You know, here we have this, you know, psycho uh, serial killer who's skinning women and turning them into women's suits. And that's, you know, when people think of trans people, unfortunately, these are the kind of images they get. And then there's movies that, you know, seem harmless, like um, like Ace Ventura, Pet Detective. But for people that are familiar with that, you know, the scene at the end when they find out that the that the um, the suspect they're looking for is trans and then Ace Ventura had kissed her previously. What does he do? He starts vomiting. He puts a plunger over his mouth. Everyone else in the scene, all the guys in the scene start puking and people think, oh, that's just funny. That's poking humor. But really, what message is that sending? That's sending this message that trans women are so disgusting and so abhorrent that everyone vomits just by the idea of kissing one. And that inherently, you know, whether people realize it or not, influences people's reaction towards trans women and their willingness to date them. And it's no secret in the trans community that there are tons of males that identify as straight that, that are very interested in trans women, but will not date them openly because of the stigma and because of the pressure. And this is where a lot of the violence, not to get too in depth into this, but this is where this violence and this trans um, panic or gay panic defense often comes into play. Someone has sex with a trans woman and then freaks out afterward and beats them to death and, and then use that defense in court. So these, these kind of things in film and in mainstream media have a huge effect on the trans community and how we're seen by the general public. Yeah, yeah, I can appreciate that. You know, again, something that was meant to be viewed in one way is so damaging and can have lasting repercussions in people's mindsets because you know it's part of pop culture and it's just unfortunate that it that it you know again that we don't have that awareness of that then creates and informs how we depict uh people because they need that type of representation that creates fairness equitable e equity and just i don't know just a, a more open mindset so then here's another question for you. What is a small little irrational fear that you have? Oh, small irrational fear. Um, I, I think one that all trans women struggle with, and I've realized this from just talking to so many other girls, is that we're never going to see ourselves the way we want to. Our bodies and our images are never going to match how we feel in our mind. Um, no matter how feminine we appear or how we feel, there's always this fear that um, that there's still these masculine aspects to ourselves that we'll never um, be able to get away from. And I, I, and it becomes and it, what I realized too is that you know for me there's people will look at me I'm I'm still very muscular which I like being and I don't think there's any reason why women can't be muscular and, and embrace that. I mean I think there's so many amazing women athletes that um, that epitomize this. But um, but it's maybe easier for people to understand why I would struggle with the masculine aspects of my appearance. But I've met, you know, tons of trans girls that have a lot of close friends in the community and girls that are, you know, even what like by society standards would be considered extremely feminine, drop dead gorgeous, 
still struggle with these same issues. I, I just think there's so much stigma and it's been driven into our minds so much of what, you know, of who we are and how we fit into society as women that it's, it's really, really difficult to not um, have these irrational fears surrounded with the parts of ourselves that we grew up with that we don't identify with. Interesting. If you, okay, maybe, so maybe again, just shifting gears one more time with another question. Uh, are you a dog or a cat person? Well, I, <laughs> I would say both, although I currently only have a cat. Um, I have a little hairless sphinx named Dawkins who terrorizes most of my friends and <laughs> many of uh, many of my friends consider the devil. He's like my little buddy and loves me to death, but he can be very aggressive. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> there, there are many of my giant power lifter friends that are, you know, these huge guys over 300 pounds and they're terrified of my 10 pound kitty. <laughs> but, but, um, but uh, I, I've always loved both. Growing up, we had a number of dogs. And the only reason I don't have one now is because I travel too much and I'm gone too much and it just wouldn't be fair to them. But I, yeah. I'm an animal lover all the way across the board. I love every living creature. And I was always the kind of person who felt bad when I stepped on a bug or anything like that. And when I was little, I used to catch frogs and snakes in the swamp by where I played baseball. And I grew up way in the sticks, if you haven't figured that out by now. <laughs> but um but I used to catch frogs and snakes and name them and build little homes for them and all that kind of stuff. I, I don't know. I've just always loved all forms of creatures. I freaking love that. I think that's absolutely adorable. Um, so then our last question in our lightning uh, lightning round, what is a favorite memory that you have? Oh, my gosh. Um, I, I'm fortunate to have so many. I mean, obviously, the birth of all my children, but even more than their birth, just all the special experiences and you know times we've shared together for anyone who's seen the documentary like when we're playing in the pool we're playing chicken with my, my three boys that you know stuff like that we've done so much but those kind of memories are just amazing but you know but then of course I have um, really fond memories of competing and powerlifting you know winning my first world championship is one of them um, breaking the all-time world records another because those were things I spent like decades working towards and finally achieving them you know it was a really satisfying accomplishment um, and then I would just, you know, so many amazing experiences I've shared with family, friends, um, girls I've dated. Um, I've had some, you know, really good re relationships. I'm currently single, but um, but there's been a lot of great times to be thankful for. And uh, I've lived a very, a very, um, a life I'm very thankful for. Even though there's been some bumps in the road, I, I think those have just made me stronger and helped me deal with adversity more moving forward. And I'm just fortunate to have so many loving people in my life and have so many great experiences to be able to reflect upon. That's really beautiful. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, yeah, we've reached the end of the show. Thank you so much for joining us, Janae. It's truly been an honor and uh, we admire you so much for who you are and your commitment to making this world a better place, not only for yourself, but for everyone in our community. And uh, I truly, truly consider it a privilege getting to know you. So thank you. Thank you so much for everything you've done for us. Oh, you're welcome. And thank you so much for allowing me to share my story and share my message and, and to reach your viewers. I really, really appreciate that. Welcome back, guys. It's time for us to answer your questions. Scott, deliver to me. Oh, my gosh. We have some good ones today, so I hope you have your thinking cap on. So uh, the first question comes from Duncan. And Duncan asks, what do you think the most overrated piece of pop culture is? I would probably say that Game of Thrones is probably that thing that I feel is a bit overrated. Did I lose your friendship now? I mean... No, not at all, actually. <laughs> the series was terrible in comparison to the books. It always upsets me so much. Yeah, I feel it was just a bloated piece of pile of shit, actually. I, I feel like this happens a lot with fancy novels. Just look at the, the extension that they did with The Hobbit. It was just it was just boring, really. It wasn't really entertaining at all. So, yeah, I, I don't really understand the fuzz about Game of Thrones in general, not even the good seasons, uh, because I feel that it was just, it, it, to me, it didn't translate well 
compared to the book. So yeah, that's probably my, my biggest issue. So Scott, what about you? Um, oh gosh, you know, this one is kind of an easy no brainer for me for most overrated piece of pop culture. Uh, it's the Kardashians. I cannot <laughs> stand them in the slightest. I have zero interest in them whenever they do something, say something or in the news in some way, my eyes just glaze over. I just could not care less. Oh my God. I can't believe you just said that. I know we're probably gonna lose so many people who are so upset with me now, but you know what though? I stand by it. I don't like the Kardashians. I am convinced they're overrated. <laughs> Fine. All right. Next question. <laughs> uh, in a horror movie, how would your character die? And this one's from Chase. Oh my gosh. If I were a, if I were a character in a horror movie, I would probably die in a really lame way that actually had nothing to do with the killer's like machinations. So like I would probably be the person who was just trudging along, like moving forward blithely, uh, like not, not paying attention to what's around me. And I'd probably just fall off a cliff and die. You know, like the, 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 the killer didn't have to do anything. Nothing bad had to happen aside from me being a klutz and just a general. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> what about you? Like how, how would your character meet its gruesome end? Well, since, since I'm a nocturnal creature, I feel like I'd probably die like a vampire in any vampire show, which is probably right in the middle of sex, having an orgasm and then getting a cold stab <laughs> from my chest. I mean, I, okay. I mean, that's, uh, thank you for painting a very <laughs> explicit picture that I will not be able to unsee in my brain now. So thank you for that. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So our last question for today is actually coming from Alicia. And she asks, in a rom-com, what would your meat cute be? I feel it would be really cheesy or, or in a really cheesy way, which is me dropping like a hot cup of coffee onto your lap and then try to bite, wipe it off of you and we'd start having a conversation and then, I don't know, things would unfold. I, I feel that's that's probably how it would happen with us. What about you? Nothing, nothing says romantic love like a scalding hot burn in your groin area. I mean, exactly. I, I know that's the quickest way to get me like interested in somebody. Well, um, <laughs> no, I think for me, like it would be something silly, like um, you know, like we were in an airplane stuck on the tarmac for like hours on end. And, you know, since we had nothing else to do aside from wait for the plane to take off, we just strike up like a, a really like just fun, lively conversation. And just the time flies by. And, you know, we just have like that, like romantic, like we just, we just then continue the conversation on the rest of our journey, wherever the plane ends up taking us. Oh, that's adorable. I love that. I, th I, I would, it would have been so cute if that actually happened. Right? Right? I would like to think so. Yeah. But now I'm going to show a bad side for you, Scott, because I'm going to expose you to the Swedish language once more. And... Oh, gosh. Yeah, I'm sorry. So, moisturize, moisturize yourself. Get yourself ready. So, today's word is run in Swedish. Okay, 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 okay. And that is springa. Okay. Springa. Perfect. Yes! You did yes! it. Yes! All right. <laughs> I mean, I could probably do some more springa in my life right now, but, you know, it is what it is. Absolutely. So now if you see a bunch of mobs going towards you, you can actually tell your Swedish companion exactly what you want to project and just tell them, springa, it's time to run. <laughs> uh. <laughs> I love this. I love this. That's so great. All right, guys. Thank you for so much for listening today if you want to keep up with us you can find us on social media instagram twitter and now even at, on youtube at queer as pop you can find me under the username novakaze and scott at the kill cannon on twitter scott is also a fabulous twitch streamer with a lovely community so check him out at kill cannon on twitch thank you so much for this week guys and have a nice one bye 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 bye